All right, good morning, everyone that is watching this or will be watching this um, online. We're continuing within clashing worldviews in the U.S. Supreme Court. We're in chapter four. We talked about and we camped on the 14th Amendment and the DeShaney case, DeShaney versus Winnebago County. Okay, just quick review. DeShaney versus Winnebago County is a child abuse case. It's a case that involved a child that was neglected by a mother and was abused by a stepfather and the state was derelict in stepping in and removing this child from the house. The child suffered irreparable brain damage and it went to the Supreme Court and the issue in the case, a couple of the issues in the case is number one, does the 14th Amendment's due process clause require the federal government to step in in families and start removing children from families where they think there is some form of child abuse. Okay, in other words, can the Fed, the national government, okay, because normally state governments deal with this, local governments, okay? That's one of the issues. The second issue is, when we talked about this in class, is this issue of sphere sovereignty. Which sphere is supposed to be the primary protector and one that takes care of and rears children? Is it the government? or is it moms and dads? Okay, which is it? The other issue in this case, again, is the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Do you interpret it broadly or narrowly? Okay, there's a little more, but that's the general idea. And we stopped and we talked about it, and you know, Daniel was here last week and he gets all fired up and he makes the class interesting and I'm not sure if he'll be here, but I purposely did not expand on, okay, how do you determine states' rights and the national government's rights? I just let the thing lie there. It, I, I used some of my Willy Wonka on you, okay? If you remember the original Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder, that's the best one. The suspense is terrific. I hope it'll last. So I just let it stay there, okay? But I'm, I'm gonna explain a little bit more how to interpret the 14th Amendment, okay? And how Rehnquist did it and how Blackman did it and you, you know, in the words of Fox News, I'll report, you decide. Okay, so one of the things that I want to, again, go over briefly is just this idea of sphere sovereignty, okay? Because the issue before Rehnquist and black men in the Supreme Court is, okay, uh, what latitude do we give civil society, okay? What is civil society? If you remember the 1828 dictionary, definition of government by Webster, okay, you, in other words, you, you've got multiple levels of government within any society. You've got individual self-government, then you've got family government, and you've got church and voluntary associations and clubs, okay, and then you have civil government. And the premise that the founders understood was you've got to have a really thick civil society, which is individual self-government, family government, churches, clubs, organizations, volunteer organizations, boys clubs, any of those types of things, okay? Red Cross, okay, that needs to be really, really thick because if that's not really, really thick, guess what's gonna get really, really thick? The government, okay? So you pick which one. So the issue before the court is, do we allow the continuation or the continual strength of uh, uh, civil society, or does the government needs to get its hands into it because the government can fix it, okay? Our understanding of civil society, you heard that term before, civil society? It means the non-governmental side of life, or you could say it means freedom, right? The, what, what we freely do without the government telling us what to do. All of you freely came to church this morning, or this class this morning, okay? Nobody coerced, the government didn't compel you to. Or in other words, it's free, it's, it's the free association of people, okay? So, so where do we get that idea? Where do we get this idea that there's a part of society that government can't touch or shouldn't touch? Unless, of course, there's legit law breaking. It actually came from the, the separation between church and state that occurred uh, from the time of Jesus until the, the kind of relative modern era, this idea that there's a, there should be a separation between church and state, okay? Now I know when I say that, some Christians bristle, 
but our idea of the separation between church and state comes from the Bible. It did not come from secular government, okay? Remember Uzziah, right? He reaches in to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. He's the king. He steps into the office of the priesthood. What happens to him? He gets leprosy, okay? There's multiple issues like that. In other words, this idea that there's a sphere that is government, there's a sphere that is church or, or uh, cl uh, ecclesiastical, okay? Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, what is uh, God, what is God's. Okay, so he's making a, dis isn't he making a distinction? And yet, if you understand what he's saying, everything's God's. So even government is under God. But this thinking, okay, began to permeate uh, the later Roman Empire, particularly when it became more Christianized, it began to permeate the Middle Ages. So this idea that there's a sphere of, of the church that the state can't mess with. Okay, that, that, that's the same. And that's where we get the idea of civil society. Family, church, clubs, organizations, volunteer organizations. That's where it came from. Okay? And so um, the theory behind civil society is government is not and should not be all powerful. There are segments of society where the government, you know, again, who's better at raising your kids, you or, you know, the federal government? Um, and so, so this idea crystallized into this concept called sphere sovereignty, okay, where there's a number of autonomous spheres that should regulate their own affairs, okay? The religious sphere, the family sphere, the educational sphere, the labor sphere, the business sphere. Now, as I'm saying this, you probably, some of you might be thinking, ahead, yeah, but the government gets involved in all that stuff right now. <laughs> yes, but I'm trying to just show you the idea of how it emerged and the thinking behind it is there's some spheres that the government is not supposed to get involved in unless there's legit law breaking, okay? But that's, and again, this is the issue with the DeShaney case. Um, so the role of government, okay? There's specific responsibilities, you know, national defense, that's probably a good one, right? In other words, I'm not relying, Debbie Stanford is a wonderful person, but I'm not relying upon her to defend the nation against Little Rocket Man in North Korea, right? Kim Jong-un. We're, we're gonna let the, we're gonna let the, you know, the, the military do it. In other words, there's something that the, that the government is really good at, and we're really good at military. Okay? We're really good at the enforcement of laws. Okay? But again, but there are certain areas where the, when the government gets involved, um, it's not good. But here's the problem, the sinfulness of man. The, the, the humanity's corrupt. We're built with crooked timber. There's something wrong with the human race. So do families fail? Yeah. Do some fathers abuse their kids? Yes, they do. Is there neglect in the home? Is there unethical business practices? Sure there are. Does labor do wrong? In other words, so, so when that happens, okay, who is chomping at the bit to get involved? And the average American is chomping at the bit to get the government involved. He hit me, right, like little kids. But there's some spheres that the government just doesn't do. It's really clumsy. It's not good at. Okay, and that's where we get this idea of the shame, you know, this, it's... It's very clumsy in getting involved in child abuse cases at the federal level. Because remember what we said, if the federal government, if, if the court decided with DeShaney, the court decided against DeShaney, DeShaney is the little boy that was abused. On one hand, you're going, that was wrong. But think through the implications. If the federal government has to get involved in child rearing in some way, shape or form, it causes every state agency it causes every local agency that deals with child care, child abuse, they're gonna back down. Because they realize if I get involved in this, I can be, I am subject to what's called, it's called torts, suing, okay? And so, in other words, if, if the court had cited with Ford DeShaney, hooray, the little abuse boy won, that meant that moving forward, now, the states and local agencies would back off because they're like, I'm not getting involved in this issue because we're just going to get the pants suit off of us. You see, in other words, it's prickly. This is why it became a Supreme Court case because either way you choose, you lose, right? Either way you choose, you're like, ah. And in other words, it's kind of like when, when you're in school and they, the, the teacher had on the test, you had to really watch, choose the best answer. And the word best was in italics. <laughs> That's when, you know, and you're like, oh, great. Which, what does that mean? That means maybe three out of the four are, like, right. Okay, that's kind of the shame.
Okay. In other words, because like, on one hand, if you're like me, you first read this, your heart goes out to this little boy. You're like, we need justice for this little guy. But Rehnquist, who decided against the shame, realized the best justice is to not get the federal government in the child abuse business. Better to let Wisconsin, again, Winnebago County was in Wisconsin, write better laws to punish child abusers. And it, since this case happened, that's exactly what Wisconsin did. They imposed significant penalties on child abusers. I mean, as far as jail time, in other words, this idea to disincentivize the practice, okay? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, so that's, again, that's, that's the issue. That, that's, that's the, you know, I remember when I first read this case in grad school, and you know, my professor, J James Davis, the author, you know, he would regularly get on the students and, and, and just, oh, really? Okay, you wanna, you wanna side with the kid? I, okay, and he would just let you, let you get all you know, emotionally involved, and then he would nail you with what I just said. Okay, do we really want to let the federal government get involved in all this? Because think of the ramifications of this thing. Okay, questions, thoughts before we move on? Okay, I'm gonna move this here so I'm more on the camera. Um, okay, so we stopped at, okay, how do you interpret the 14th Amendment? Because the, the Shaney is a 14th Amendment case. Okay, the 14th Amendment, remember, has three clauses with it, within it, okay? The 14th Amendment was written after the Civil War to give the newly emancipated slaves three rights. Due process before the law, equal protection under the law, and, and privileges and immunities, okay? So the issue before the case, and, and this was a due process case, okay? Due process before the law is the steps the government must take before it takes away your right. Can the government take away your life? Yes, it can. But in order to take away your life, it must follow due process, you know, jury trial, right to a, an attorney, perhaps Miranda warnings. You can go through the whole the habeas corpus. You can go through this whole list of, laundry list of things that the government must, all these hoops the government must jump over before it can take away your life and your liberty and your property. Can the government take away all three of those? Sure they can, if. So, so that's why DeShaney is a due process case. In other words, government may step in and take a child away from a parent if it follows a particular due process of law, okay? So, so the issue before the court was, okay, does the 14th Amendment give that right? Now, now before Blackman, who was a progressive Protestant, and before Rehnquist, who was a conservative Protestant, do you interpret the 14th Amendment broadly to say that it did, or do you do interpret it narrowly to say that the due process clause doesn't? Rehnquist interpreted it narrowly because based on his law school education at Stanford, his professor Fairman taught, and I think correctly so, because I've read his Stanford Law Review article, that the 14th Amendment applied specifically and only to the freely emancipated slaves. It is not a blank check or a charter for action for the court to step in and give this class and this group and this individual that. In other words, what Rehnquist understood and how the framers of the 14th Amendment understood the way they wrote it was, if you want your new right, get your own amendment or get your own legislation. That is constitutional, okay? Blackman, thought the exact, the exact opposite. He, he thought that the 14th Amendment should have been interpreted broadly to now cause the, uh, Joshua DeShaney uh, to, to get a new right, and he's choosing, choosing to expand the interpretation of the Due Process Clause to say that doesn't just apply to freed African-American slaves, that applied to child abuse victims. You can see where this can get really prickly and really controversial and really like, heart, you know, heart, your heart goes out to, to this little boy, okay? But again, in doing that, that means that the federal government will start striking down state laws and the federal government's gonna start getting stronger than the state governments on this issue, okay? Make sense? Okay, we, we talked about that a little bit last week. Um, so, um, let me see if I can get this real quick. So, we left here. This is where it's controversial because Daniel had so many questions, and they were great questions, and I love those questions because they're worthy to be asked. Okay, um, the Due Process Clause has been used.
to strike down state laws to give us things like the Miranda warning, jury, uh, uh, jury trials in state cases, um, uh, the right to an attorney in state cases, protection against uh, Fifth Amendment violations. Okay, in other words, the, the, the police taking you in the back room with bright lights, dark room, a lot of smoke, and, and twisting your arm to get you to coerce, to coerce you to, to testify against yourself, okay? That is the court expanding the interpretation of the 14th Amendment to move way past freed, American, freed African American slaves to criminal defendants, okay? But when the court does that, again, it gives the federal government a lot of power and strikes down state laws. So, and this is what I, this is where we ended last week. This is where it was kind of controversial. Because on one hand, you're going, yeah, we, we don't want the, you know, and of course, it's all the rage right now. The police, defund the police. Okay. So, so and, and if you think it's bad now, go back to the 1930s and 40s and see how they treated defendants. It was really bad. States regularly violated the Fifth Amendment. But again, remember, they could, because again, the Fifth Amendment begins, we go back to the First Amendment that says, Congress shall make no law prohibiting. In other words, the federal government was straight-jacketed and had to abide by the Fifth Amendment, but not state governments. So it was not unusual for the, the police to strong-arm people in the back room to get, hey, we got a confession. Oh, okay, that was just, okay? So, so you're kind of like, okay, on one hand, yeah, the police shouldn't do that. But the flip side, do you really want the federal government starting to strike down all kinds of state laws? Okay, there's the dilemma. The, 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 the 14th Amendment's due process clause was, gave us Roe versus Wade. The 14th Amendment's expansion of the Equal Protection Clause gave us Lawrence v. Texas and the Obergefell decision in 2015. Lawrence v. Texas was 2003. So in other words, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. What do you do with the 14th Amendment? Do you interpret it narrowly or broadly, okay? Again, traditional understanding of the 14th Amendment, and I've read the backstory from the history of this, and this is what Fairman wrote, okay, the professor at Stanford. This is what Rehnquist was taught, is the 14th Amendment only applies to the newly emancipated slaves. You can't apply equal protection, due process, or privileges immunities to defendant's rights in the back room when the police are strong on you. And we can go through the whole list. Can you still get those rights though? In other words, are you still entitled to those rights? Are you entitled to not be beaten up in the back room to be coerced to testify against yourself? Yes, you cannot do, you can't do that. What Rehnquist understood is you can't do that. But don't use the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection and Due Process Clause to, to get that, okay? Get the appropriate legislation, get an amendment, or, or, and this is where I stop, because again, I chose to leave the tension. I, I talked about you a little bit, Daniel. And I said, <laughs> what I did last week was for Daniel, but all of us, is I used a little Willy Wonka on you. And if you remember the classic line in the movie, the suspense is terrific. I hope it'll last. I did that, okay, just to leave it in the air so you could think this thing through, okay? Because what Daniel was getting at, Okay, is, is what Rehnquist understood and what conservative Protestants understood and what conservative Supreme Court justices understood. Okay, is that again, they, they were very reluctant to expand the size and scope of the federal government. Because again, Rehnquist realized if we go this direction into Cheney, if we, dis, if we decide for this little boy's rights and now the federal government can start getting involved in families to start pulling kids, we've just altered the structure of the Constitution. You've just basically defeated federalism. What is federalism? This idea that there's gotta be spheres. Remember we talked about spheres. There's got to be a space for the national government to operate, space for the state governments to operate, and space for local governments to operate. You can't just merge them into one big blob, okay? They call the marble cake understanding of federalism, where it's just, you know, you don't want a marble cake. It's like all the ingredients are mixed together, okay? In other words, Rehnquist was like, we're not going that way, because I see what's happened. Once that starts happening, the federal government is involved in, in the child care business. We can't do that. So, there's three ways the Supreme Court justices interpreted this, if you can see this on this back here a little bit, if you can kind of see it. 
um, is you know, the fundamental rights interpretation, total incorporation, selective incorporation. Okay? This is where Daniel was going, whether he knew it or not. And again, I chose to let just the suspense is terrific. Let's just, you know, we're going to keep Augustus Gloop in the tooth, right? 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 That's what he just says that line. If you remember the movie, right? I'm a big Willy Wonka fan. He's, he's in that tube and he's stuck and he's like, the suspense is terrific. Just keep it going. What's going to happen? Okay. Because I just tried to get you to think about this. So, so what Rehnquist understood is, and this is very much in line with where Daniel was going, is what's called the fundamental rights interpretation of, of due process, equal protection. Okay. We're not going to get into privileges and immunities in a minute, but is, is this idea that there's no necessary connection between the 14th Amendment and the guarantees in the Bill of Rights. In other words, so if you're a Supreme Court justice and you're looking at DeShaney, you're not looking at the 14th Amendment. Don't even, yeah, we know it's a 14th Amendment case, but you are gonna say, I'm gonna reject using the 14th Amendment as a portal. Because what, what the court has done is they, they've taken the 14th Amendment as a portal and they go through that to straightjacket the states on all kinds of issues. And so fundamental rights, and this is where Rehnquist was coming from, I reject that. And so then Daniel's responding, again, I'm using him as a straw man, it's just fun. <laughs> yeah, but what about these fundamental rights? Don't, and the answer is, don't worry, we'll get there, okay? So the 14th Amendment protects traditional notions of due process, principles implicit in the concept of ordered liberty in a Supreme Court case called Polko versus Connecticut. That is what, Rehnquist understood is that there are certain principles implicit in the concept of ordered liberty that cause us as justices to make good decisions, but we're going to make a good decision by not limiting the power of the states in the process and wreck the structure of the Constitution. That, because remember, Rehnquist looked at the Constitution like a Christian, a conservative Christian looks at the Bible. It's a covenant, it's a binding agreement. So Rehnquist is gonna, hey, wait a minute, the states through their state ratifying conventions in 1788, 1787, they ratified this constitution. We can't alter that unless you wanna have a constitutional convention. So then how do you deal with it? You don't alter it, but you, you, you be very concerned about you know, this concept of ordered liberty, but I'm not gonna mess with the structure of the constitution to get there. Does that kind of make sense? In other words, over and over in his writings, in his Supreme Court decisions, Rehnquist would say, well, over and over, several times, he said, we, we as judges are keepers of the covenant. Okay, so, so in other words, when he says that, he says that means as a Supreme Court justice, I'm not going to sit there and stretch the Constitution and make it like a rubber band and make it say whatever I want. I'm going to honor the original covenant unless the people want to have a brand new constitutional convention. Uh, so, in criminal procedures, and this is where Daniel was getting it, and rightfully so, his concerns were very valid. These are legit concerns. You know, it obliges a state to grant the defendant fundamental fairness essential to the very concept of justice. Because remember, when we're talking about criminal cases, not all criminal cases, but most criminal cases do not start at the federal level. They start at the state level. So, do they enjoy Fifth Amendment protections? Do they enjoy Fourth Amendment protections? Do they enjoy Eighth Amendment protection against uh, you know, cruel and unusual punishment? Yes, they do. But, but remember, the first, ten bill, well, the first nine Bill of Rights limited the federal government, not state governments. So how do you, how do you give those Eighth Amendment protection against cruel and unusual punishment? How, how are you protected from the police brutalizing you in a cell? Okay, when you're in prison and you, you're helpless, okay? It's this idea that there, there's fundamental fairness in the concept of, judge, uh, of justice, okay? Um, so the, the Bill of Rights is pertinent for determining what that means, but it's not determinative. Boy, that sounds like a lawyer term, doesn't it? In other words, you can look at the Bill of Rights to get a general idea, but you don't have to just stay there. You can draw from other concepts. One of which is this concept of common law. One of the, which is the concept of precedent. One of which is this idea that, hey, just certain fundamental, there's fundamental fairness here. It's not right for the police to take somebody in the back room and strong arm them to get a confession, okay? So here's an example, okay? The Fifth Amendment says, 
Where did it go? <laughs> Why did it do that? I have it absolutely, like this. no, I know exactly what happened here. Sorry about that, people. Um, for those of you watching, please pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, what has happened is my, um, there's a section in the computer where it's, it turned off the, um, it turned off my Apple TV. And because of that, I lost this. Oh, well, I'll keep fiddling with it, but until then, let's just, let's just try to explain this, okay? So the Fifth Amendment provides for a grand jury in a federal trial. It's a federal, okay? What's a grand jury? It's like a trial before a trial. It's, a, it's, a tri it's an intermediate trial that tells you whether you can, whether there's enough evidence for you to go on trial. Okay? That applies to a federal case. In state cases, it doesn't. But fundamental fairness says, hey, if it's good for the goose, it's probably good for the gander. So you can apply that to the states. In other words, you're not using the 14th Amendment to get there you're just saying fundamental fairness says, hey, if it's if it's right for somebody uh, uh, at the mercy of the federal government to 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 have an intermediate trial to see if there's even enough evidence for you to 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 go on trial, then that just makes sense in the state level. That's fundamental fairness. Okay, this is where Daniel wanted to go, and I would not let him get there on purpose. Okay, because I wanted, but I, because I, this this doesn't this bring this in the bold relief? Because again. If you start applying the Bill of Rights to the states, you are straightjacketing the states, and you're not letting them govern for themselves on those issues. And remember what I talked about last week. The states were considered social laboratories by the founders. Hey, if Michigan's screwing things up, <laughs> Illinois can look at it and go, we're not going there. Or if Michigan's doing things wonderfully on a, a wide range of issues, it becomes a model for all the other states. In other words, it's this idea that, that states can experiment and, and you can see what's working and what's not working. Okay, I can tell you as living in Illinois, I think Illinois was the 49th out of 50 states, economically and tax base and all that kind of stuff. The exodus of businesses and individuals is huge. Okay, that reveals to us that the constitution is still working. In other words, the constitution doesn't prohibit, didn't prohibit me to move to come here. I didn't come because of that reason, but, but there's a lot of people leaving. There's a lot of businesses leaving Illinois because of their tax burden. Okay, that is federalism in action. That is our constitution still working. Because in other words, it punishes, because what happens when you got all these people and businesses leaving the state? How does that punish the state, the, the state government? It goes broke. Why does it go broke? They lose their taxes? Exactly, yeah. In other words, so, so, this, so perhaps it'll get you know, Springfield, Illinois' attention and go, wait a minute, maybe all of this entitlement society stuff and maybe all of this redistribution of wealth and all, you know, and it, like Michigan caters to Detroit, Illinois caters to what small little city? Chicago, yeah, you may have heard of Chicago, okay. In other words, but this idea that and we're seeing this throughout the country where you're seeing Texas and Florida, you know, where there's so much freedom, you know, no mask mandates and blah, blah, blah. Okay. That is federalism. There is not a one size fits all policy on masks. Thank God. Either, regardless of whatever you think about them, you should be very thankful there are 50 different versions of it. That's federalism. Okay. And, and so what Rehnquist was concerned about is, again, if we go this direction, now it's a one-size-fits-all plan on child care and the federal government's in control of it. And he's like, no. And we talked about this also last week. If you don't like it in the state, you can leave. Go somewhere else. Move somewhere else. Okay? That is our system. In other words, the Constitution is still working. Okay? But, gosh, I, why, I don't know why this crazy thing. I'm going to try one more time, people. If you're watching at home, sorry. There's a little... There it is. Come on, go, go, go. There it is. There's a little section here in my computer where I can tell it, I can tell it to um, to revert back to the screen, and hopefully it's going to go back. To, but does, does that make sense? So, so fundamental fairness recognizes that a state procedure can violate due process, okay? But it, it doesn't have to violate the first eight amendments. Or there's a okay. Let, let me say f f fundamental fairness. They use common sense. It's probably, don't get, so this gets a little complicated, but they use common sense. So the answer to Daniel's question is, what about the right of the accused if you can't use the 14th Amendment's due process clause? They use common sense, and they recognize that, hey, there's certain things you just, you just don't do, and you do it right. 
okay? Now the pushback against fundamental fairness is, well, that's very subjective, isn't it? Because who's determined which judge between judges is gonna think that, hey, this is fundamentally fair and this is fundamentally fair, okay? But the counter argument is, yeah, but if we use the 14th Amendment as a charter for action, we're gonna twist the Constitution up like a pretzel and we're gonna fundamentally alter its, 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 its um, structure and we're gonna mess up federalism and then we're gonna prevent the states from making their own decisions. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the states or the federal government? Federal. The states, the colonies were first. They can't conflict with the, the Constitution though, which right. is federal. But the colonies came first which became states. Not with regard to law. Which caused the founders at the Constitutional Convention to recognize we cannot ignore states' rights That's when right. we create this binding agreement. I'm trying to show you how they thought. Okay, if you had to go, go back and read the Federalist Papers, read Federalist 44, 45, 46, you'll see what they're talking about. Go read Madison's notes on the Constitution. They say this over and over again. They don't say which came first, the chicken or the egg. But, but they make the argument, which came first? The state governments, colony states, or the federal government. The colonies, states came first. So that causes, we've got to recognize federalism. We cannot ignore states' rights when we create this constitution. Does that make sense? I encourage you, get the Federalist Papers, Daniel. Get, you can get a real cheap, if you've got a Kindle, okay? You can get a copy for like 99 cents, really cheap. But you can read them. But again, Federalist 44, 45, 46 talk about this very idea. Okay, let me give you an example of a, of a question I want to pose. Okay. Sanctuary cities. Mm -hmm. Are those are those uh, created by state or federal protection? The Let's cities just talk are, about the concept of what they are, not what they're supposed the to be. The cities are local governments right. subordinate to the states in which they reside. There is a there is a there was a lower court case called the, it's, it's it's called the Dillon's Rule. It came about in the 1860s, where the court ruled and the Supreme Court has honored it ever since then, is that local governments are subordinate to state governments. So in other words, a state can take Flint, Michigan, into receivership because it's messed up its water supply. And that's not Flint's fault because it, there's a lot of blame to go around there. Mm -hmm. But but if it actually wants to, the state can come in and take over. In other words, they can have no no local government, no mayor. The the, the, the state of Michigan can control it until it can get back into ordering. It almost happened in Detroit a few years ago. That same idea. The federal government does not get involved in those. So when the government has a law called the Patriot Act, which gives them the right to go into any city or any place and abduct a person that they deem to be a terrorist or a threat to the country. Do they not have a, I mean, and I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to talk to you in terms of that I'm for this, okay? I'm just trying to say how skewed. No, I appreciate the question. We've gotten. So they can go into a city, according to the Patriot Act, which was added, and abduct anybody because basically, according to that law, uh, sanctuary cities are just phantoms. Because they can go anywhere in the country and take anybody into custody and interrogate them and question and detain them as long as they want if they're deemed a threat. And that was signed by the Bush administration. And, and it's been upheld by the Supreme Court. So right. Yes, that is national law. Exactly. So that trumps the state trying to protect well, the Well, in, in that instance, yes. In, in the instance of the Patriot Act and someone fomenting an act of domestic terrorism, yes. That city must surrender that individual because the federal law in that case is binding constitutional. So it brings us back to the full concept of that these laws are being put into place that undermine the Constitution in itself by the fact that they can detain someone improperly without due process, with no with no warrant, no FISA warrant, nothing, if they're deemed a terrorist and detain them without legal counsel. That's what that, that Patriot Act, if you read it, basically goes into, into play about and says. Okay. We're losing our Constitution. The Constitution, and where I'm going with this whole circular argument, is the Constitution has to be upheld as fundamental above state and supreme law because it is the precedent where if we lose that, we lose our freedom and our rights. And it's an illegitimate authority. That's kind of where I'm going with the whole you're, thing. Okay, I'm trying to follow you here because I'm agreeing with so much of what you're saying. But what you're saying is the... The, the, the Patriot Act and the ability to... Is unconstitutional. I should have un, it's unconstitutional. It is, but yet it's an established in an act, law. In an act of terrorism, in a legit act of terrorism, 
The federal know. government does not have to defend us against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What about when the government itself becomes the terrorist? And they are the ones that plant things that could cause the things as false flag yeah. events. And now you've got a cover up, covering up a criminal, which is your actual government. Balls were dropped with that. <laughs> That's not good. Okay. I would have, a, okay, not trying to steer the issue away, but I, I would have a much more, I have no problem with the government coming in and deal with legit terrorists because I think that that's one of their fundamental that's what they're supposed to do Debbie Stanford as much as I love her is not supposed to do that I need individuals you know uh, looking like Jack Bauer or something like that you know going around and dealing with them. I'm thank God for those kinds of people I have no problem with that what I do have a problem with is when they're surveilling law-abiding citizens and checking out all of your emails and text messages and they things are. like that Snowden blew right. the lid off that's where I you know but but that it is not unconstitutional for the government in time in the exigencies of war. And again, the idea of the premise of the war on terrorism is never ending. Okay, yeah, could that be a license? Sure, it could be. But this idea that you're dealing with an ideology, you're not dealing with a nation state, it goes on and on and on, you gotta deal with that. I don't I don't have a problem with that. Because it's I do have a problem with them surveilling all of our stuff without a warrant. I think that's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Absolutely. Well, what's the difference between a uh, listening in us without us or asking for you know your vaccine passports or anything else they're violating your personal effects okay. it's, it's an i'm trying to just keep it i'm, I'm trying, trying to keep what i'm trying to say the is that there thing. has to be a way out to have to have our freedoms and liberties intact and if the states are allowed to undermine it where i'm going with all of this and you don't have a fundamental how are the states on, undermining it because they can, hold on how are the states undermining it in the case of the patriot act they're not it's a federal government issue, not a state issue. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. The fundamental thing, that's the whole point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to show loose ends on both sides. The fundamental principle, the highest law of the land that we should not undermine is the Constitution. The Constitution is, is that not the highest law of our land? R correct. Okay. Correct. So it would, it, you can't recognize that it's okay for a state to fundamentally make a law that would undermine the very protective rights that we enjoy under the Constitution. So you can't say a police officer can go into a back room and beat you uh, without due process. That violates your fundamental right to life, liberty, and right. happiness. And, and where I'm going, that under the fundamental rights interpretation, they would say, yes, correct, you can't. I'm just trying to say, I'm trying to show you another way to get to where you're thinking. And this is how, I'm trying, and I'm trying to show you how Rehnquist thought this is how he thought. He would agree with you. He would just say, I'm not going to, I'm not messing up federalism. I'm not messing up the structure of the Constitution to get there. There's a way to give you a, 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 a judicial remedy that doesn't have to mess up the Constitution, is what he's saying. And other judges, in other words, it's not just Rehnquist, this is a whole stream of thought within jurisprudence. Generally, not always, generally, your more conservative Supreme Court justices, like a Clarence Thomas, like in Kavanaugh, like in Gorsuch, like in Amy Coney Barrett, would go this way. That, that's all I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say what Dan wants, they get, but it, again, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to look through the eyes of conservative and progressive Protestants. Rehnquist saw the Constitution as a covenant, just like you'd say the Bible is a covenant of, of laws were under grace but you know this idea that you don't alter the thing subjectively based on how you feel it is it is objective truth it's true for all time you align yourself to it you don't align it to you and so that, that's exactly what, what Blackman was doing he's trying to align you know he's trying to square the constitution with the times Rehnquist is trying to square the times with the constitution you see how that's a totally different way of looking at things you can manipulate it to make it say what you want it to say because you disagree with it and you want to align with what you want. Okay, is there a provision within our Constitution for people to do that? Yeah, they're called legislators. They do it all the time. That's not judges. In other words, if, if Congress wants to align, you know, change the laws to fit the times, they can. But again, because that allows us as the people to have a voice in it. We don't have a voice with the Supreme Court justices. They're the most insulated branch as they come, right? Mm -hmm. That's how the founders said the thing. You said, like, hey, if you, the founders had no problem with change. A lot, a lot of times that they're leveled, all they're a bunch of reaction. They don't want, they were fine with change. Get it through legislation or amendments. And because they said, the way, why? Because that gives the people a voice in the process. 
By the time you get to the Supreme Court, you got no voice. You've got, you know, the platonic guardians overall going, oh, we're smarter than you. We'll make a decision for you. And there's a word for that. It's called oligarchy, ruled by the few by their self-interest. And in many respects in our country, either through the administrative bureaucracy or through the Supreme Court, we're actually more of an oligarchy in America than we are a constitutional republic. You know, money interests, <laughs> bureaucratic interests, uh, ju you know, jurisprudential interests at the high, yeah. That is, in other words, we talk about power to the people and the average American doesn't have a clue and they don't realize we are ruled by bureaucratic elites we're ruled by, you know, uh, judicial elites. We really are. And the, the voice of the people has been removed. Anyway, so do you understand fundamental fairness or fundamental rights? Okay, kind of. Again, this is constitutional law. You got to put on your thinking caps a little bit here, but I'm going to help you understand this a little bit. So the flip side of this, okay, and um, I'm not, Blackman wasn't totally this way. He was probably more selective. Total incorporation is all of the Bill of Rights is incorporated through the 14th Amendment. In other words, once the 14th Amendment was written, it doesn't just apply, apply to the newly emancipated slaves. Because remember, okay, forgive me here, I'm going back. There it is. All persons, okay, it, total corporation looks at that and says all persons. What does that mean? It means all persons. In other words, they don't look at the, the historical context of how the 14th Amendment was written. They don't, they don't realize who it was written for. They, they rip it out of historical context. And they say, all persons can be corporations, right? Citizens United case. Uh, all persons can be Joshua DeShaney. All persons can be the homosexual. All persons can be, pick your supposed disadvantaged group. In other words, so when you, oh, sorry, don't know why. Okay, so all persons is interpreted broadly, okay, not narrowly. And so, the, the, so total incorporation says the first 10 Bill of Rights applies directly to the states. So now Congress shall make no law respect, no, that means states may make no law respecting or the Third Amendment or the Second or gun rights or, again, pick, pick your amendments. Does that make sense? So, so they're going to look at it and they're going to interpret it broadly, okay? Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of? Okay, so, so these tend to be your, your more progressive judges, okay? These tend to be more your, um, your oh, Sotomayor, uh, Justice Ginsburg, um, you know, Justice Brennan, um, uh, Justice Warren, Earl Warren, there, there's a number of so, so they're gonna, so so they're gonna again, they're gonna interpret this thing very, very broadly, okay. And and again, all of the Bill of Rights applies to the states. So so they have no problem with altering the structure of the Constitution in any way, shape, or form. Okay. And then there's a third way. Wait for the same word. Um, it's called it's not selective incorporation. So it depend it depends. It depends on what the judges think. And if the judges think that it might apply to the to the to the uh, states, and it might not limit the states, okay. So so those are the three main ways. If you're a conservative Protestant, um, for the most part, you're going to side with fundamental fairness over that because you're going to a conservative Protestant generally has an inherent suspicion about the federal government getting so strong that it limits the state governments. You have. Do you care about Joshua DeShaney? Of course you care about Joshua DeShaney. Do you care about the right? Of course you do. But you're going to say, the government is not my solution. I mean, the government can help in some of these areas, but the government is not, it doesn't best deal with these issues. And what Rehnquist ultimately decided on, the families, who was responsible for DeShaney's abuse? And he would say, the stepfather who did it and the mom who didn't stop it. Blackman would say, who's in, in response to that, who's responsible? The state governments and the state agencies that didn't deal with it. A conservative Protestant understands that sin lies within and is free moral agents 
we are uniquely responsible and we need to own our sin. We need to own what we've done wrong. For a progressive Protestant, sin doesn't lie within. The problem is generally without. So you change the environment. And if you change the environment, you create better people. So he was much more interested in going to the government, change the environment. The federal government can change the environment of state uh, agencies dealing with child abuse. If we could just fix that, that's going to solve child abuse. Rehnquist said, no, you got to go to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is the human heart within that stepfather and the mom that didn't step in and do what she needed to do. That's how you deal with it. Okay. Can you see how understanding a worldview and a Christian, it, it leads to very profound implications, totally different trajectories of where you're going here. Okay, totally different. And, and again, it's, it's, it's muddled up by your heart goes out to Joshua. Okay. If you've read the case in oral arguments, Rehnquist responding to the lawyer says, poor Joshua. In other words, revealing these guys, these are not just heartless uh, uh, legal bureaucrats. Okay. They actually cared about, and when, when, Rehn, when, when Blackman wrote his decision, being totally angry at Rehnquist for going in that direction, he said, poor Joshua. In other words, he thought Joshua is not going to get the legal remedy here because he thought the remedy was without. He never thought, hey, what about the stepdad that was doing it? You think the state might need to deal with that guy? What do you think? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. He didn't think that way. He didn't go in that direction. Because again, to a progressive Protestant, the problem is environment, not internally. Okay. So, so this is where you see in, in dealing with crime, in deal, you, you'll see progressives, liberals, deal, okay, trying to change the environment. Hey, less prison terms, less this. Uh, more government money going towards this, this program, this agency, because they think if we can just fix that external, we're going to have better people. Whereas a conservative Protestant is like, until you deal with the sin in thing, and until, okay, and I'm going to talk about this this morning, the message, forgive me, there's always, it's, it's amazing to me, every time I teach this, it's always connection to Sunday morning. Which is the most humane way to treat a person? As a person or as an object? The Christian view of crime is I treat you as a person and you are morally responsible. You need to take ownership of it. So now I treat you as a person. Yeah, there's some punishment, but I'm treating you as a person. The, the progressive view rejects that and says you are an object that could be manipulated. In other words, if I can manipulate your environment, I can change this option. So they treat pe they treat people as objects to be manipulated by. Hey, let's educate them better. Let's throw more money at it. Let's socially engineer society. Let's redistribute power. Let's redistribute wealth. I'm treating you as a subject, almost like in a lab experiment, as opposed to a person made in the image of God who has a, a, a who has a moral conscience and a moral nature that is responsible to God and responsible to people. That's how you heal the nation. You deal with it that way. Progressives say, no, <laughs> the way you heal a nation is you change the environment. Because humans are basically good. They, they reject the idea of sin. We're not sinners. We're actually basically good. And if we can change our environment, we can make better and better people. That's social engineering. Okay. So they, right. never, they never look towards the fact that man is just a sinner at heart when it comes down to wanting to do what he wants to do. No, because if you remember the chapter in chapter, uh, chapter 2, the chapter on chapter 2. The chapter in Blackman, we talked about his progressive Protestant upbringing. For progressive Protestants, sin is not individual. Sin is social. So sin is society. If you can change the... And this, is, this drives critical race theory. This drives cultural Marxism. Change the structure. The problem is the struct. If we can change the structures of racism, if we can change the... Is there racism in the structures of humanity? The answer is yes, because ding, 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 there is sin in humanity. And when humans make things called culture, called it, sin gets into that too. If you've ever had, you remember the cool kids club in school? Were you part of the cool kids club? That's structural oppression, isn't it? The cool kids, were you part of the, oh, you weren't part of the cool kids? No. Well, then you got beat on or you got made, is that structural oppression? Sure it is. In other words, yes, it's there, 
But again, for, for a conservative product, you're like, no, no, you're not getting at the root. You're, you're, going, let's get, let, you're going way down line. Let's go upstream from it and go back to the source of this thing. It's called sin. And you are individually responsible. Everyone is individually responsible for it. So what but progressives say, no, no, Joanna. That's not the issue. The issue is the structure of business, the structure of government, the structure of whatever human institutions there. That's, if we could just change that, we can change people. Sin is, again, they, 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 they downplay human sin and they put the, put, they just put the blame on the external situation of society. Well, can't, can't they? Can't they just realize Am that? Am I blowing your mind a little bit? Can't, can't they just realize that if all this stuff that they throw at them, they give them money, they give them this, they give them that, and nothing changes don't they realize? But if we just try it in a new way, Joanna, uh, <laughs> it just didn't. I mean, socialism has not worked every time it's tried. But if we just try it this way, I mean, that that's really the thinking. They fail to see history. Hey, how about the hundred million or so body bags from communism? You know, yeah, Pol Pot, Mao, you know, Papa Joe. They were all stand-up guys, right? It's not even trying the same thing in a different way. It's as if Thomas Edison didn't do a thousand different experiments to get a light bulb. If he did the same experiment a thousand times without changing any variables, that's exactly what socialism has done. There's never anything different. It's just, I believe it will work this time. Yeah. Why? There is no rational reason ever to think so. And part of the problem, in my opinion, is we live in a history-less yeah. culture mm -hmm. yeah. where Again, remember Hegel, newest is truest, latest is greatest. We don't look at history because the, new, the, the, the most clearest expression of what is rational, and this is how, what Hegel thought, this is how Blackman thought, is what we currently think right now, not the past. So they're not going to look at the past. They're going to, and that's, that's how we get to that. There is a, a willful rejection of history, or as one guy calls it, cultural amnesia. We just, we just, we're like a culture, we just totally, and we don't realize, look behind you. Do you see all that carnage? That's what this led to. You, no, but we'll, we'll do it a new way. Did you, Dan, you have a question? I was going to say, the, the, the best way for us then to counteract this is, can I read this real quick, Isaiah 9, 6? Sure. It says, uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. The everlasting father prince of peace so when we have jesus ruling as a kingship in our hearts we automatically set the precedence for what a godlike culture looks like and the results thereof whether it's in our business whether it's in our churches whether it's in our relationships and our marriages and fidelity all of it right but They're, those who are trying to fix what's going on they don't look at that they're not they will look at that. at that. I disagree with you. They will look at that. They'll have no choice because the results will speak for themselves. I'll give you a case in point. I want, I want to do a barbecue business next. I met this African-American guy working in Meyer, right? He's black, I'm white. Well, according to all this other stuff, I'd have to incorporate something that makes him, you know, you know basically what I said to him is, hey, we were talking about barbecue. We both like it. He talked about the same wood I like. Mm, long story short. Hot, spicy right. chicken. Hey, we both. Yeah, I'm we getting took, hungry right now. We were connecting on a level I understood. He goes, pecan was the best. I go, not a lot of people know that. He goes, I get mine from North Carolina. I said, that's, a, that's the best place to get it. Because I studied all this stuff. Yeah. I said, how would you like to do a barbecue business with me? And he looked at me and he said, here's my number. He gave it to me and I came up. With, and the, the Lord, and I, I think the Holy Spirit gave this to me, but it was B&W barbecue, black and white barbecue, collaborative cooking with style. We all smoked the competition. <laughs> so um, now there, you have an example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you have an example of a black and white guy having fun with this whole racist thing, but yet at the same time having fun with what we like to do, which is cooking, and we have the same yes. sort of worldview. So, uh, so, you know, and so here it works, right? And now this business, and I know this because I've talked to other barbecuers, can pull in an extra four or 500,000 a year just in that little barbecue business. To me, that's not bad. And it's something I'm, it's fun. It's like, while I'm thinking about it, I need to talk, August 28th, there's a big gathering, a worship gathering with Trudat mm -hmm. in Barron Springs. They're looking for food vendors. If you're interested, talk yeah. to them, because I want to connect. But do you see how this, by operating through the anointing and stuff like that, 
how we've solved a lot of things. Now, what kind of a witness is that going to be that him and I are there having fun together, working together, and there was no social construction in that. It was just all done through the anointing, I believe, and the love of God and just the wisdom that God gave to do that. It wasn't for me. But, but you're missing out on the rainbow pride barbecue. <laughs> yeah, you can do all that. That's just not how the government looks at anything. From what we're learning here, they have a mindset that they can control everything, they can fix everything, doing exactly what they're doing. And if, like my pastor said, if that doesn't work, then they'll try something new. So they're not, until they listen to that, until they see that, they will do the same thing that they've been doing continuously. Yeah. No, they'll, they'll, they'll never attack. change. They'll, they'll never see. Yes, definitely. They will. Yeah, yeah, because because they again, can, they'll try to put you down. Their worldview causes them to understand nothing different. That's the thing I want to understand. That, that's the premise of this whole book. Your worldview determines the trajectory you're going to go. If And again, remember, two fundamental aspects of progressive theology, progress, progressivism, but progressive theology. A, a skepticism of the Bible as authoritative. That's what. So, so, so that's not authoritative anymore. So, what is more authoritative? Science. That leads to the third premise: a rejection of original sin. We're not sinners. Just that alone. Just that rejection of a key biblical doctrine leads to socialism. Leads to communism. Le leads to the uh, the bureaucratic administrative state. Uh, because again, you think that, wait a minute, we, humans are not evil, they're basically good. So government, if you give government enough power, it can re-engineer all segments of society and lead to a more flourishing culture. It's called the myth of progress, it's called utopianism. Socialism is utopianism, communism is utopianism. Uh, progressivism leads to some form of, in other words, this idea that the good life can come through government. If government gets enough power, enough money, enough control over society, keep all these little chicks together, we can create a better society. Conservative biblical Protestantism rejects that. says, wait a minute, you're forgetting something really, really fundamental. We're sinners. The founder said, government is people, but people are flawed. So you've got to limit government. Progressivism says, no, you've got to give more power to it because humans are basically good and they can fix it. Again, the worldview leads you in two totally incompatible <laughs> directions. You, just, you, you can't, there's no agreement here. And a lot of it has to do with what is authoritative, what truth is authoritative, and what does it mean to be human? If we're not sinners, then yes, it makes sense to give government more power. It makes sense for the federal government to control childcare within parents and parenting and families. It makes sense under that logic. If they don't see themselves as sinners, they'll never see God. Well, yeah. Yes, never. that's There's a good no We're fleshing out the public policy yeah. that results from that. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're exactly true. Yeah, because if you're not a sinner, what do you need God for? Yeah, <laughs> good. that's right. There's no God. That, that, that's, you know, that's the fundamental, that's the tripping point. It's like, you can't yeah. get through this one, I, you know, because you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, did you have a question? Or I was going to get back to some constitutional law. Phyllis. Well, just a comment. What <clears throat> what I'm seeing right now on the news is be, the one good thing about the pandemic is that the Zoom classes and parents are real, really realizing what their children are being taught, and they are going to the student body and saying, "No more. We're not. We're not accepting this." So that's what you had said before. We the we have to get involved in um, whatever level God calls us to, just like what Daniel was doing to start that. Once the parents stand up and say, no, you're not going to teach our kids this uh, critical theory, and that they said our kids are coming home feeling terrible that they are white. Right, yeah. And feeling they're the ones feeling oppressed. Because they're and, and white and so mean. And yeah, and, and that is America. I mean, and that's that, how it's supposed yeah. to work. <laughs> yeah. In other words, when people start speaking up and saying stuff like that, sure. You know, I've you know, I've checked with Brad Owen and asked, how's Bridgman doing? He goes, eh, it's not on our radar. Critical race theory. It's not. It's not around here. Mm -hmm. 
But you said you're probably more knowledgeable than I am about it, but I, you know, because I'll ask. But yeah, it's true. Okay, let's move on a little bit here. Um, so we talked about that, okay, so the Equal Protection Due Process Clause is being used by the Supreme Court in a lot of these cases, okay? Criminal law, uh, social issues such as abortion, such as gay marriage, things like that, okay? What about privileges and immunities, okay? What it talks about in this chapter, and I think it's, it's really good for you to understand it, the court basically doesn't use that one anymore. It got rejected in 1873 in what's called the slaughterhouse cases. In Louisiana, mm -hmm, hot and spicy, okay? Th there was uh, some, some uh, slaughterhouses, uh, and Louisiana gave one slaughterhouse a monopoly over all the others. So all the smaller players were like, hey, that's a violation of our privileges and immunities as American citizens. The 14th Amendment says so. The court said, no, you can't use the privileges and immunities clause. And they said for a couple of reasons, one of which was the privileges and immunities clause was written for the freed American, African-American slaves. It's not for businesses that get ticked off because you weren't granted a monopoly, you can't use it. The second issue is you can't make the rights of the citizens of the federal government larger than the rights of the citizens of the individual states. If you do that, you mess up federalism. Does that make sense? Okay, now you're getting back to some of the core of, um, of um, what Daniel was getting at, okay? And here's the phrase, if you can see it. The court determined that the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States could not be as broad as the privileges and immunities of the states. Okay, and again, this is something that many students of constitutional law miss, is they're trying to say, you've got to keep the balance. If, if, if the privileges of you as a citizen of America is larger than the privileges you have as a citizen of Michigan, You've violated, the, you've violated the structure of the Constitution because now that means that the federal government can just ride roughshod over everything. You've got to allow the states to have their own individual rights. That make sense? Again, this is federalism. 14th Amendment deals with this balancing act between, okay, I get it, uh, 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 defendant in the back room being beat up by the police. We want to give you your right to not be beat up by the police but we're not gonna alter the, the US Constitution to get there, okay? So what you need to know from this case is just simply, they said number one, privileges and immunities, that, that we're not gonna use that, okay? Um, later on today, so, so what the court has done ever since 1873 is they use two out of the three legs of a three-legged stool to give people rights. So in other words, so, so the 14th Amendment's kind of been hobbling ever since then, okay? Privileges and immunities. Again, the privilege and immunity you have as a citizen of Michigan is that you've got a driver's license. But the cool thing about the privileges and immunities you have as an American citizen is that individual privilege and immunity that you have as a driver's license, you can drive to Illinois and not get a ticket for not having an Illinois driver's license, right? So, so, so that's, that's the balancing act. Um, so they said privilege, you can't use privileges and immunities. So they've never used it ever since. So in other words, you would think, okay, wouldn't you use a privileges and immunities argument to get gay marriage the law of the land? Wouldn't you use privileges and immunities to get uh, transgender bath? Hey, I, I have a privilege and immunity. I have transgender bathrooms all throughout this country. The court has said you can't use that. So they've, they've chosen to totally ignore this aspect of it. Or if they did apply it, and they haven't, but they, they would tend to apply it during that time to free African American slaves. Anyway, just give them a little constitutional law. Okay. Can you, can you define privileges and immunities a little more clear? Privileges, it's just a privilege and an immunity as a, as a citizen. You have a privilege to go fishing, they have a fishing license. You have a privilege to get married. How about travel? You have a privilege to drive and travel, interstate commerce. Yeah. Were the African Americans, remember again, legal equality was on the table in 1868. Social equality wasn't on the table until about 1968. Were African Americans denied the privileges and immunities of traveling in America? Well, you technically could travel, but you couldn't buy gas. 
you couldn't eat food at a restaurant and you couldn't stay at a hotel. I mean, yeah, you could travel as far as your gas lasted you and your appetite. But that, so, so that was a privilege and immunity that the 14th Amendment gave. But again, that was not recognized socially until after 1954 in the Brown versus Education case, Brown versus Board of Education case. Does that help you out with privileges? The, the privilege that you have to go to a restaurant. I mean, stuff that we just take for granted. The, you know, you can freely do that. You can freely start a business, B&W Barbecue. The government doesn't have to tell you what business you're going to get into because we got social engineers behind the economy saying, no, we don't need any more barbecue. We need you to make widgets in the car factory. You're going to go work in the car factory. Well, I guess that brings me kind of back to my first question again. If we have the privilege to travel, why does the state have laws that make us have driver's licenses and pay taxes on it year after year after year, which is... Dumb. Because they want a standard... There's something, there's something in law called the rational basis test. That's what you're getting into there. Okay. Does the state have a rational reason to give out driver's licenses? Yes, they do. They establish the age of the people. They establish whether you've got, you're impaired or not. They establish whether or not, hey, you can't, you can't see without glasses. You got to drive with glasses. They make sure there's a uniform way of driving. In other words, there's all kinds of rational reasons for that. That's and so in other words, so if you would go to court and say, that's a violation of my equal protect or my due process rights as an American citizen that I should have to pay for a driver's license every single year. You're going to lose every day. Why? Because the burden of proof is on you as a citizen. The government has a rational reason for that. Let's say that you're an African-American person and you got booted out of a restaurant because of your race. Now there's, a, there's, there's something in Supreme Court law called, uh, constitutional law called um, strict scrutiny. Any government action that discriminates based on race is suspect. And now the burden of proof is on the government, not on you. So the government is going to lose and you're generally going to win. That's why. There's, in other words, there's a rational reason why the government, do I like pay for my tags every year? Hey, happy birthday. Oh, yeah. the, the money I got for my birthday, I get to pay for, no, do I like, I don't like that at all. Well, that's taxation without representation. But, but, but there's a rational reason for that governmental control over. It's an overstepping about. Can you, it's can you change that? Sure you can, through legislation. You, you can lobby, you know, representatives and say, listen, the fee is way too expensive. Here's a thought, Governor Whitmer. Here's a, how about, the, I, I'd, I'd be more willing to pay the hundred bucks for registration if you give $75 of that to fix the roads. Okay, <laughs> can you do that as an American? Sure you can. The, yeah, I, I would totally agree with you. I don't like all the fees. And a lot of times I don't think it's spent wisely, but there's a rational basis for that. Just like there's a rational basis for the driving age, for the drinking age, for things like that, right? In other words, and so when that happens, the burden of proof is on you and the government has more of a free pass. In other words, because it, it makes sense to have a rational reason for that. Does that help? Well, I think rational reason gets broadly stretched like they're doing with the constitution. When you say you have to be a certain age to drive or a certain age where you shouldn't by competency versus I'm gonna tax you over and over again on your license and tell you that you've got to get into the business of driver's licenses so the state can make money on you, which is tax taxation without representation, and violate your fundamental principles through that. It's the same thing as the, they're just basically defining it the way they want. So basically, if you throw somebody out of a restaurant because of their race, they're doing the same thing that affects their business. Right. I, I'm just telling, I'm giving you the law. I'm let, just saying the let, law let is, me, is, okay, is let, skewed for them. Let me take a... You can lobby government, you can lobby representatives, you can champion, hey, I have no problem paying this fee as long as X, if you really feel strongly like I do, like I get tired of driving over potholes and wrecking my axles in my car, then hey. But here's another one, okay? When, when all of this happened last March and the mandates for church closings and masks and, you know, pick, pick all these issues, met with an attorney, attorney who worked with churches. He said, here's the deal, okay, right now, the government has a rational basis for making these laws. There is a legitimate pandemic. He said, he said, hey, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm just telling you how the law works. Here's the deal. Right now, because of all this, you, you run, comply. 
I'm not saying you have to be thrilled, just comply, okay? Here's how rational basis works though. In this instance, okay, in a public health <laughs> crisis, over time, the burden of proof is gonna shift from you to the government having the burden of proof of proving why do you have to continue keep having mass mandates? Why do you have to continue to tell churches you can't meet? Why, why do restaurants have to continue to be at 50? In other words, he says, over time, rational basis shifts to the citizen in, in, a, in a health emergency like this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can see it's, it's a tension that continually goes on. Again, this is, this is more practical with what we deal with all the time. So what we're seeing with moms dealing with critical race theory or people complaining about the mass things or, or whatever, hey, the burden proof's on the government. Hey, Governor Whitmer, why do you have to continually keep this math? Why do, you, why do you still have the, the numerical limits in restaurants? There, is there a rational basis for this? And what we're finding out is, no. So now the burden of proof is on the government. The government is gonna lose if they continually keep these draconian issues. That's what's happening in, in California. You know, with, with you know, the, the, you know, the smackdowns that the Supreme Court gave um, Governor Newsom. Newsom, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I could use a nickname, but I'm not going to. But anyway, no, no, no. yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's three criteria. There's rational basis, okay? The burden of proof's on you, not the government. There's a rational reason for the law. There's strict scrutiny in cases of race, and then there's something called intermediate scrutiny, and that is gender. If discrimination happens based on gender, now you can see, and, and so, the gov so the burden of proof is on the government. So, so now you see, and, and, and the homosexual agenda and the LGBT agenda has hitched its wagons to this logic. So in court cases, you're seeing more and more the homosexual cause, the transgender cause winning because there's something in strict scrutiny called, the African Americans are called a suspect class. If, if something happens against them, there's a suspect class, you can't mess with them. That's what's beginning to happen legally with the homosexuals and the transgenders within legal footing. I'm not saying you have to agree with it. I'm just telling you how constitutional law is working right now. All right, thank you everyone for being here today and hopefully we learned something and keep watching. We'll be back next week. All right.